Revealed in upcoming episodes of this program are the contents of a recently unearthed repository classified by the secret government, the Phenomenon Archives. Recently unearthed phenomenon archives revealed that Yuri Gagarin was not the first man in space. I'm Dean Stockwell, your host. Join me on a visit with General Vladimir Ilyushin, the unsung hero of the first manned Soviet space mission. On April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union reports the successful launch, orbit, and re-entry of the first man in space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Celebration erupts worldwide over Gagarin's single orbit and the Soviet Union's landmark achievement. Gagarin goes on to become one of the greatest heroes in the history of humanity. With the collapse of communism and the rise of freedom and democracy in the Russian Federation, recent access to documents in the Kremlin archives revealed the shocking truth about a story intended to remain buried forever. Yuri Gagarin, the symbol and icon of triumphant communism known the world over, was not the first man in space. Suspicions were high from the day of the Gagarin launch. The Soviets had never announced an event of such magnitude until it was a done deal. Why did they break their own rule and give a play-by-play -play of the flight? Indeed, a rocket is launched on April 16, 1961. Completely controlled from the ground as were all of the Soviet manned missions, Gagarin is filmed boarding the capsule. But when the propaganda cameras stop rolling, does Gagarin stay on board as the Russians claim, or does something entirely different occur? On October 4th, 1957, in a feat most global experts think impossible, the Soviet Union ushers in the space age, when it becomes the first nation to put a satellite in space, the groundbreaking orbiter Sputnik. People around the world are shocked and dismayed realizing that the Soviet payload could just as easily have been a nuclear warhead capable of being delivered anywhere on the planet. This event drastically transforms the political, military, and psychological climate around the world and serves to heighten the division between democracy and communism. For the first time, Space is introduced as the new theater of competition during the Cold War. After uh, Sputnik was launched, uh, Soviet uh, press published very modest reports of some small objects was delivered to the orbit. Uh, but uh, government clearly was uh, surprised uh, by tremendous uh, outpouring of emotions by international media. And uh, finally they thought, look, this little toy can uh, give in our hands a very important political and propaganda instrument. It was used as a propaganda, as a vehicle to uh, uh, tell that socialist system is superior. By the late 1950s, it is clear to both the United States and the Soviet Union that the next space challenge is to send a man into orbit. On December 17, 1958, 
the United States creates NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which is given full authority to oversee all manned and unmanned American space activities. That there are no President things. Eisenhower started NASA and wanted to uh, deal with the exploration of space as a civilian activity. There, of course, was a, a, already a large activity in, in the services, primarily the Air Force, where they had been developing the large rockets that eventually became uh, ICBMs. Uh, uh, and they were beginning to think about deploying satellites and so on. Uh, but the uh, manned mission, uh, the manned exploration of space was assigned to NASA as a civilian space agency. And it had a, basically, a civilian character from the beginning. Several highly trained military jet test pilots are chosen by both nations to defend the honor of their respective countries. The Americans name their space travelers astronauts and encourage abundant publicity by the press. In sharp contrast, the Soviet space program remains a highly secretive branch of the military. Test pilots become known as cosmonauts. Everything about them and their work is classified top secret, including the number of men chosen and their names. Even the cosmonauts' families are kept in the dark as to their loved ones' activities and missions. Everything was so secret. I understand that I cannot explain it to you. It is this part with, uh, which you can only understand if you live there. I even can explain it to my children now, why it was secret. Because it has no explanation. And no, nothing. It was part of this life. You cannot tell this, you cannot tell this. The, sa the same like it was uh, dangerous to meet any foreigners. The rules uh, vary in the uh, Russian space program that no one who didn't fly before uh, would be known. Names were kept under secret. Facts only recently uncovered in documents stored in the Kremlin archives reveal the extent to which the government interfered with the Soviet space agency. In October 1960, a huge new booster rocket appears to have malfunctioned at the time of launch. Instead of taking off, it sits on the launch pad. Ignoring all warnings and overriding safety precautions, the Kremlin orders the launch director and engineers to fix the problem immediately in order to get the rocket off the ground that same day. Marshal Nidalian, who was the head of rocket strategic forces, personally sitting in the chair next to the rocket was in preparation before the launch. He demanded that uh, this chair should be brought next to the rocket. And uh, it was completely against all the safety regulations. And uh, everyone around knew that this is against the safety regulations, but uh, everyone thought, look, if I wouldn't get uh, 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 placed next to the big uh, boss, uh, I might be f uh, fired ne to ne next day from my job. With nearly 200 men inspecting the rocket, including launch director Nedlin, a huge ball of fire suddenly erupts and instantly vaporizes everyone in the vicinity. Amazingly, this historic tragedy is not officially confirmed by the Soviet government until almost 30 years later. I don't think uh, the high officials in government, including Khrushchev, uh, could be uh, considered as directly responsible for this type of uh, failure. There was a pressure from government, uh, mostly perceived pressure. Everyone wanted to get uh, uh, promotion, uh, new decorations, and this is why everyone uh, worked very hard. But safety regulations were extremely strict, and only uh, such a high official like like highest mili military commander could uh, personally violate the safety precaution. Other Kremlin documents indicate that as many as seven cosmonauts are killed in secret space flight attempts and training accidents prior to Gagarin's historic flight. 
Kosmonov Slodovsky, Shiborin, Mitkov, Dolgov, Balakhanev, Kachur, and Grachev are never honored for their pioneering work or for giving their lives in an attempt to reach their elusive goal of space. Instead, their names remain deeply hidden in the Kremlin archives on a secret list of cosmonauts who perished tragically in the many rocket accidents that occurred during the formative years of the Russian space program. Space missions in the early days were anything but perfect science, especially when it came to landing. Mission control could approximate, but sometimes it would take hours to find the capsule. NASA astronauts came down over water, cosmonauts over land. In the early days, the Russians had to jump out and parachute to safety. On that day in 61, several eyewitnesses, farmers, report that Gagarin's chute appeared over the field where they are working. They run to him, hoping to shake the hand of the man who's just made history. Before they can get there, a helicopter swoops down and takes him away. We can tell that the, the Russians were trying to be secretive, that they were, they were uh, covering up something uh, and not being totally truthful. Uh, we have photographs where, uh, where we have two versions of the same photograph where we believe a cosmonaut in training has been airbrushed away. These guys, and they were all guys, felt that they were doing something for the country and that that was the price that they paid, which was never being acknowledged and never really having an opportunity to bask in that. That was the point at which a lot of these guys became increasingly clear that they had been shafted and uh, they became angry and there was a lot of anger but they couldn't do anything there was no place to go there was no free press there were only family members to hear their stories and after a while they had told those stories and what more could they do between 1959 and 1961 the Soviet Union prohibits the release of any facts negatively reflecting on the space agency which itself is shrouded in top military secrecy. One of the things that most Americans don't understand is the secrecy that went into the Soviet program, that it was in fact a military program. Nothing was announced ahead of time, nothing, no details were given, and only if it was successful did it show up uh, in the public press. The Soviets undoubtedly put tremendous effort into secrecy. Khrushchev is not concerned for any individual cosmonaut, but for the status of his country in the space race and in the theater of world opinion. His fanaticism and fear of the United States during the height of the Cold War borders on paranoia. When you are talking about my father and how he threatened Americans, it's a very different uh, explanation and very different angles. One of them, he really wanted to threaten you for death. It was used here, the threat, because it was part of his uh, conversation that the Soviet system economically more effective than capitalist, and then he told, if you will not uh, take our place, then we will bury you, which means socialism will bury capitalism. No, all my life, I woke up when some rough wo voice in the morning told, I'm burying you. So we had an environment of uh, competition uh, in space that was really part of a larger competition that was mostly military and political in nature. Uh, and uh, it was a general sense of threat and uh, unease and uncertainty about where this whole thing was gonna go. People had images of uh, bombs and vehicles of various kinds flying overhead all the time. It was a genuine threat to the attitudes and psyche of uh, people in our country, and I'm sure people in the Soviet Union at the time. Duck and cover, that was the motto. In case of a nuclear blast, school kids were told to climb under their desks to protect themselves. It was pretty wacky. The sky wasn't safe anymore. 
not after Sputnik. Khrushchev knew he had America on the run, and if he could deliver a man into orbit before the US, well, didn't that mean that they had won? Didn't that mean that the Soviet system was better? As I said, it was a wacky time. Khrushchev becomes obsessed with the idea of being the first to successfully launch a man into space. He orders the head of the Soviet space program, S. Krolov, to make it happen no matter what the cost. Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Ilyush, one of the Soviet Union's most popular and experienced military test pilots, is perhaps the most likely candidate for the job. With dozens of speed records to his credit, he also holds the world altitude record of nearly 30 kilometers, set in 1959. He tested some of the most sophisticated designs the Russians had, including uh, uh, many Sukhoi designs and a design very similar to our B-70 aircraft. Uh, he was a hot rod pilot. He, he was essentially the equivalent of our, our uh, Chuck Yeager. Ilyushin comes from, by far, the most distinguished military and engineering family in the Soviet Union. His father, Sergei, is a Soviet hero of unparalleled importance. Sergei's design and construction of fighter and bomber planes contribute to the Soviet victory over an invading German army during World War II. Sergei Ilyushin, the designer, uh, was very much involved in World War II fighter planes. And the Soviets, the, the Battle of Stalingrad, the IL-2 Sturmovik was probably the most famous of all the Russian aircraft, being a, a ground attack aircraft. So this gave him huge stature under Stalin, and then of course uh, Khrushchev when he took over. Sergei Ilyushin is a member of the inner sanctum of power, being a distinguished deputy leader of the Supreme Soviet. His sphere of influence ascends to the head of the Soviet space program, S. Korolev, who himself works under Ilyushin as a junior aircraft designer prior to World War II. The relationship between the famous designer father and the test pilot son is strained. The willful son, ever mindful of being cast in his father's shadow, sets to free himself and resists being groomed to succeed the elder Ilyushin in the family business. After World War II, the elder Ilyushin correctly envisions the future of aircraft manufacturing as being diverted from military to passenger craft. However, consistent with his jet pilot image, Vladimir stubbornly rejects this pathway preferring to remain a test pilot and designer of military jets. In a final act of defiance, Vladimir joins the Sukhoi company in 1952, his father's competitor. In late 1960, Vladimir Ilyushin is awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union, the highest possible military award for his altitude records and overall service to the country. This honor, equivalent to the Congressional Medal in the United States, is bestowed upon only a select few. Throughout the 1950s, the relationship between elder and younger Ilyusha is one of anger and distrust. This, however, culminates in a relationship of mutual pride, respect, and understanding. Initially, the young Ilyusha snubs the thought of flying in space. The space capsule operated exclusively by mission control engineers via remote control with no hands-on cosmonaut interaction, seems more a mission fit for dogs and lab rats than the best test pilot of the era. In spite of this handicap, literally all of Ilyushin's best flying comrades join the cosmonaut corps. Riding the wave of his Medal of Honor, and encouraged by the choices of his most trusted peers, Ilyushin changes his mind and begins actively pursuing the goal of becoming the first man in space.
Ilyushin views space as his personal opportunity to step out from under the shadow of his larger-than-life father and to become a distinguished hero in his own right. With his own professional accomplishments added to his family's tremendous political influence, Lieutenant Colonel Ilyusha is ultimately given the much coveted opportunity to become the first man in space. It was therefore, in my view, no accident that Vladimir Ilyushin would have been picked as the man for the job. I mean, it was an obvious choice. Uh, he was the right age, uh, he had the right training, he had the name. It would have been perfect had it worked. When producers Hamoff and Stillman first contacted Vladimir Ilyushin about his story, the man broke down in tears. Imagine the relief he must have felt letting go of a 40-year-old lie. Getting the opportunity to be first hadn't come easy to Vladimir, despite his father's prestige and his own jet pilot accomplishments. The trip into space would require a good deal of training and preparation. He had gotten a late start. Compared to his comrades, he was way behind. Because his fellow test pilots are well into their second year of spaceflight preparation, Ilyushin must doggedly engage in several months of intense catch-up, training to put him on equal footing and preparing for his life's calling. The entire process is shrouded in secrecy. If somebody will begin to think that we have to publish that we are planning to go to send the cosmonaut to the space, then publish this name. First of all, it will be even very difficult to imagine, even to Karolyov and these people, because everything was so secret. Then after that, it was impossible to receive the permission, because the way of life was different, and the answer would be very simple. Why you have to do this before you reach your goal. For what reason? According to declassified documents, Ilyushin is put into his capsule named Roshia and launched in top military secrecy on Friday, April 7, 1961. At the time, the CIA and other military intelligence organizations neither confirm or deny the detection of the launch or the flight. Presumably, they do not want to tip their hand as to the extent of their intelligence capabilities in detecting Soviet launches and orbits. Sources very close to Ilyushin report that during the flight, Ilyushin evidently loses consciousness sometime after the third orbit and before re-entry, causing mission control to lose contact with the capsule. We know now from uh, an article in Aviation Week and Space Technology that in fact the Soviets had attempted three orbit flights uh, in trying to recover a capsule. This was in 1959. So that's been one of the problems with the Aleutian story all along, is uh, that the three orbit was an American program where a single orbit was the Soviet. But now we know that's not necessarily true. So I believe what happened was that uh, that Vladimir Lushin was put into orbit. Something went wrong aboard the spacecraft, uh, whether the, the uh, guidance system or, or whatever, and that for several hours he was subjected to conditions that were not conducive to his health. At the time, the Soviets had not yet perfected proper re-entry and landing capabilities. Therefore, cosmonauts were expected to eject at 10 to 20,000 feet and parachute to safety. Recently uncovered Kremlin documents revealed that Ilyushin was unable to eject and was forced to make a hard landing in the capsule. Amazing though it may seem, he survived, badly hurt, but alive. He made a successful recovery, but uh, he was hurt, either physically or emotionally. He was not presentable to the public. At the time of Vladimir Ilyushin's flight, there were several reports internationally. One was in England from a reporter that was in Moscow at the time. 
There was one of a French reporter that was there on that day, one from Bulgaria. Uh, various American Air Force people made comments that an attempt was made. And those sources were independent. You know, they wasn't, it wasn't a case of one source and then another by picking it up. They were separate sources. The government-controlled Soviet press refuses to acknowledge the foreign reports and later forcefully denies the story altogether by way of several conflicting and contradictory excuses. The entire Soviet government is in great confusion and turmoil surrounding the only partially successful event. Marxist-Leninist economics and Marxist-Leninist politics prided itself on being a scientific, objective analysis of human and natural law. And if you are really good at your Marxist-Leninist theory, then nothing in the real world should be less than perfect. So it was a great embarrassment not only to disclose this fact externally, but to have to admit it internally in the halls of power. All the failures were known only to a narrow circle, and uh, you know there was a kind of uh, oral history. You know, you could learn from friends what happened at the launch. But uh, uh, it was amazing that now, in retrospect, we did not have more failures than. Uh, I think the way uh, government tried to hide the failures was really detrimental for the program. I think they were put in a situation then that, that uh, they didn't have somebody they could present to the public. And here, Khrushchev had been using the space program as, as one of his big uh, propaganda hammers. And to have this kind of, of, of failure, it was intolerable. So when Khrushchev came to power, he made our society much less closed. But before, everything was secret. Now, still many things remain secret, which had no explanation. Because, for example, he, they told, why we have to talk to all the world about our failures? It will not help us. The regime's whole purpose in being was to preserve itself. And to preserve the ideological basis that justified the Communist Party's control of Soviet society. And if you're sitting in a meeting and you're told that the most significant public personality in science has been injured, and the most significant technology that we will win the Cold War with failed, you have no choice but to cover it up and move on to the next potential victim. The story initially released by the Soviets claims that Ilyushin is recuperating in a Moscow hospital from a car accident that occurred the month before. The next report claims that Ilyushin suffered injuries in a car accident that occurred two years prior and was in a coma, so could not possibly have had anything to do with the space program. This even though photos were taken of Ilyushin over that two-year period. Numerous contradictions of this nature add to the skepticism of Western journalists. Within weeks, the Soviet government reports that Ilyushin is being transported to a remote rehabilitation hospital in China. There, he is said to have remained for a year after the suspected flight. There were two reports uh, on Vladimir Ilyushin being injured and being sent to China. One of them had him in a Peking hospital, one of them had him in a Hangzhou hospital. Uh, it's very doubtful to me that somebody in a car accident in the Soviet Union, especially the son of a famous aviation designer and somebody himself, a test pilot, a military test pilot, would be sent to a Chinese hospital for uh, recuperation. Any China connection, in hindsight, seems highly unlikely. But if indeed Ilyushin was sent to China by the Soviet government, 
it was most probably to keep him beyond the reach of Western reporters. In a highly suspect coincidence, on Saturday, April 8, 1961, the very day after Yushin's ill-fated mission, an internal meeting is quickly scheduled by Korolyov for various members of the military and government for the purpose of introducing the next first man in space, Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin. Keeping true to the overall secrecy of the Soviet space program, the details and film of this meeting are not made public for several years after Gagarin's flight. After Khrushchev sees that Illusion isn't going to be the propaganda hammer he wants, he quickly moves on to the next victim. It's easily justified. They delivered a man into space and brought him back. The fact that he passed out is a formality. Russia has beaten America, and they must tell the world. Gagarin's appointed in a special meeting of the Soviet leadership on a Saturday, the day after Ilyushin's flight. So Ilyushin is launched on April 7th, Gagarin's appointed on April 8th, and then four days after that, his rocket was launched. But was he in it? By comparison with Ilyushin, Gagarin is a novice test pilot, still wet behind the ears. He does not have a single noteworthy accomplishment or record to his credit. He is, however, attractive, young, and a committed member of the Communist Party. Five days after the Ilyushin flight that is never officially reported by the Soviet press, the successful Gagarin launch is reported. In the Soviet Union of the early 60s, it was very easy for people to accept this because their lives were, were essentially cut off from the rest of the world. There was no satellite television. There was no radio from BBC that was easy to get. So the world outside the Soviet borders didn't really exist very much. So that's why when they told the story that Ilyushin didn't really do what we now think he may have done, or that Gagarin did do what they were told he did, or that the Soviet Union was first in space and greatest ideologically, politically, economically, and scientifically, all of that was very easy to accept. Nevertheless, Gagarin is given a hero's welcome and immediately sent on world tour as the spokesman for triumphant communism. The Ilyushin flight becomes a non-event. The Kremlin apparently destroys all evidence of his mission, including films and photos, ordering all participants to keep quiet or else. Considering the thousands of people involved in Ilyushin's training, launch, and post-flight recovery, the rub-out of Vladimir Ilyushin's mission certainly rates as one of the greatest cover-ups in the history of mankind. A lot of us, of course, have wondered with some kind of awe and amazement, how could they have managed to have kept it a secret up until the day that Gagarin shows up on television? And, you know, the simple answer is, they had no other choice. Either that or your family would suffer. You'd, you'd lose your job. You'd, you'd go to prison. You'd be killed. And uh, that fear had a very powerful disciplining effect. So I think the, what uh, came down was, it was a joint decision that you know, Vladimir would just basically just be quiet. He had a career that he wanted to pursue as a test pilot. There was an agreement that he would be quiet and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't try to eliminate him. 
With the advent of Russian democracy and the rise of freedom, along with the recent accessibility of the Kremlin archives, Ilyushin's story can now be substantiated, if not proven. There were really three types of documents. There was the pre-launch documentation, there was the catastrophe, and there were documents pertaining to uh, discussions that took place after the event. Unsung as well, due to the paranoia and secrecy of the Soviet government, are the extraordinary accomplishments of another man, Sergei Korolev, the brilliant Soviet space designer and father of the Russian space program. The Nobel Prize Committee on two occasions approaches Khrushchev, once in 1957 after Sputnik, and again in 1961 after Gagarin's flight, wanting to bestow the Nobel Prize to the chief Soviet rocket designer. But the name Korolev is never to become known to Westerners until well after his death. So it's have no reasonable explanation. It's even difficult not explain to Americans, but to Russians now, why nobody wanted to give the name of Karolev when the Nobel Committee asked this because they want to give him Nobel Prize. And the Soviets told, no, no, we don't interest in Nobel Prize. He is secret. So it is part of this, of this society the part of this uh, society was just recovering from the Stalin history. It's take, taking a long time. Probably the most interesting element of it was the Shakespearean character, of the, the, the life that was led after these events by Gagarin and Lucian. Of course, if Gagarin was not the first in space, he was probably aware of that fact at some point, and that may have led to his demise, alcoholism, and lack of control in public. Apparently he became uh, very difficult for the Communist Party to cope with because he would say things in public that were an embarrassment, if not outright uh, dangerous. There are even reports of Gagarin throwing a glass of champagne in the face of Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev at a government function. Thereafter, in March 1968, Gagarin dies in a highly publicized but equally suspicious MiG jet crash. His body is never recovered, and only a finger of the once great hero is found in the wreckage. This leads many experts to question the events of his death and inspires a full-scale investigation into the crash. In perhaps the ultimate irony, Vladimir Ilyushin is appointed to head the committee responsible for the investigation. The report is inconclusive, leaving many nagging questions unanswered. No details of Gagarin's death are released to the West. It is Ilyushin himself who tells us, eyeball to eyeball, what he has never told anyone else, that in his investigation of the crash, Gagarin's body simply wasn't there. They found the pilot's body strapped in right where it was supposed to be, but the only evidence of Gagarin was his finger. The life that was led by Ilyushin uh, was actually quite significant. I mean, he did not only work as a test pilot after the fact, but he also uh, became a significant designer. And I think it's kind of tragic that the one man who the world acknowledges still today as the great hero actually may have been a fabrication. And that's kind of a sad end to the story, that the two guys went different ways, and each, in one sense, got the reverse of what you would have expected. The hero wound up being the tragic figure, and the one that they tried to bury turned out to actually make a lasting contribution. General Vladimir Ilyushin still works today as a chief designer for the Sukhoi Aircraft Manufacturing Company. To his credit, he has test piloted over 145 aircraft, including the Sukhoi 27, the premier Russian interceptor fighter jet. 
To this day, Vladimir maintains his silence over the events of April 1961, perhaps still fearing for himself and his family. The legacy of the Soviet Union in the space arena that is most troubling is this need to cover the old bad stories and the old hard truths and either gloss over them or deny them. The conclusion I've come to in hearing their responses is that it's just too hard. That even though the permission is there, the social permission, the bureaucratic permission, the emotional and bureaucratic baggage of getting all of this story told is just too much. In the midst of the secrecy and cover-ups, there lives a hero who must take consolation in the knowledge that he has, through his personal efforts, propelled humankind to a place not previously known. Thanks to Vladimir Ilyushin, our world enjoys technological achievements from which we are all still reaping the benefits. Finally, with the truth uncovered, Vladimir Ilyushin's sacrifice of silence may no longer be in vain. In a fax he sent us before we traveled to meet Ilyushin in Russia, he assured us that we would have our story that he would be interviewed and state on camera that he was indeed the first man in space. But when we arrived at his home and sat down with his family for dinner, his change of heart made it clear that someone had gotten to him first. Will Russia ever come clean and admit the truth about Ilyushin's flight? Maybe not, but it matters less now since we've found the facts in Phenomenon Archives.